I'm with Judge William Alsip of the Northern District Court. Uh, my name is Leah McGarrigal, and we're here in Monterey, foggy Monterey, Bastille Day, July 14, 2014, at the Hyatt Regency Conference Center for the Ninth Judicial Circuit Conference and conducting our video oral history for the Historical Society of the Ninth Judicial Circuit. Um, Judge Alsip, I'd like to start our brief interview by asking you about your decision to become a lawyer. I mean, you know you grew up in Mississippi and were a math major in college, and yet you ended up at Harvard. So can you tell us how that decision came about? I was born in Mississippi in 1945 and grew up there. Jackson was my hometown, the small town. I did go to Mississippi State for college. I started there in 63 and ended in 67, and that was right at the zenith of the Civil Rights Movement. And all that was exploding around us uh, at the time. So that was a big influence. Uh, one, one of the, just, this, just the, uh, the justice of the situation uh, where I grew up was a, was a factor, and, and I was involved in the campus version of the civil rights movement, uh, much safer uh, proposition. Uh, I was the president of the uh, most progressive organization on campus, the student YMCA. So that was one influence. The other influence was uh, debating. I was on the debate team mm -hmm. and we had a tiny little team, only four of us at first and then later about six. We went to tournaments uh, starting first at the regional level, but eventually got invited to national tournaments, and we did pretty good. Uh, we had a good team. And that experience uh, influenced me. Now, I had started out thinking I was going to be a civil, engin civil engineer, like my dad, who had died when I was 15. Uh, he didn't go to college, but he, in those days, you didn't need to. So I wanted to be a civil engineer. I was good at math and so forth, but as time went on, I gradually went over from taking the engineering courses to uh, being more absorbed in my la certainly my last two years of co college uh, to the um, a different career path. And I wanted to be a lawyer. And I remember that it was really the, uh, 1965 was the pivotal year. I decided I was going to go into law and not and not go into engineering. So. That was those two things, the civil rights movement and the influence it had on me, and debating, which was totally an extracurricular activity, but you know that's what college will do to a kid is change your direction. Well, I've been fortunate to hear you speak at several events where you've talked about growing up, so um, I have heard you talk some about those early experiences, and the last time I heard you speak, you read from a journal that you kept as a young man. And uh, it was so moving to hear you speak the words that you had written as a 17-year-old and the awareness that you had at that age of, about what was happening in your part of the country and your part of the world. Well, my, my, my older sister, Wilana, W-I-L-L-A-N-N-A, uh, Wilana, uh, she was born before the war, so she was five years older. She uh, gave me that little five-year thing, said, you should keep a diary. So I said, oh, I guess I have to keep a diary. So it was a, a diary at first, and then in college I did do a journal, which the main difference being one is daily and one is a, you know, occasional. And uh, I, did, uh, make, I did try to note some of the more uh, important events as I perceived them as just a young kid growing up in a time when we didn't have much by way of news and television and only three stations. And in fact, in Jackson, there were only two stations and, mm -hmm. and, they, and they were pretty uh, conservative and did not did give us much of an outside view. So what I did observe, I tried to write down sometimes the important events like the March on Washington. That was one event that I made an entry that I think you, 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 you I, should, I should have brought it to this event, I could have re read it today, but uh, anyway, that, that, that when President Kennedy was assassinated was, 
was another one. The Civil Rights Bill was enacted on July 2nd, 1964. That was another one. Uh, so I, I did make some entries in that journal. And how did Harvard come to be come to be where you went for law school? Well, uh, that was actually pretty straightforward. I decided once I decided I wanted to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I decided uh, I had been stuck in Mississippi my entire life, and I needed to, I wanted to get out to do some, to see what the rest of the world was like, and. Uh, I had heard that Harvard was a, you know, the first great place to go. So I sent in my application and uh, I, I sent it in. I got ex accepted at Harvard, Vanderbilt, University of Virginia, and also at Ole Miss. I got rejected at Yale. Uh, so I decided I would go to Harvard. Uh, and I was very happy to go to Harvard. I, I enjoyed that process. There are a lot of things we could talk about, including your classmates and, and many other things about Harvard, which we'll save for another day. Um, but we also uh, did touch on earlier um, the issue before we started recording the, the topic of role models and people who were influential in your, earlier in your life as well as throughout your life. Well, certainly my older sister, Milana, was a role model, and I think uh, some of her views on the justice of the race situation in Mississippi when I was growing up. She, she was very progressive for her time. I think, I think she was a major influence on my views on, on the race question back then. Uh, I didn't appreciate that at the time. Mm -hmm. She was just my feisty older sister, but uh, I, I, looking back on it, there's no question that, but that, was, that was true. I would say the next uh, hero, more than a role model, because I could never measure up to Justice Douglas, was when I got the opportunity to clerk for him mm -hmm. in 1971-72. It was a term of Roe v. Wade. I worked with him on the Roe v. Wade case and the Sierra Club versus Morton case and uh, Newsmen a Privilege case and also the uh, uh, National Security Wiretap case. It was like the NSA problem today. It was great, it was a blockbuster turn that I got the opportunity to work with him on those. I loved him, I respected him uh, greatly, uh, and uh, he was a um, hero to me, and it would be too much for me to say a role model because I could never achieve what uh, had contributed in the way that he did, but he certainly was one. Well, it's another topic we can take up again in the future. Um, I know you started your law practice in Mississippi and uh, handled some civil rights uh, class action cases, including a large one uh, with black sanitation workers against the city of, of Jackson. You worked on a summary judgment motion, I, I believe. I did. I, I started that when I was in law school. Uh, I was lucky, uh, the, the, a fellow named Dixon Piles, P-Y-L-E-S, he had been a tank commander at Utah Beach on D-Day and was at the Battle of Bastogne and the Battle of the Bulge. He was a tough guy, short guy, rotund, bald, and just as tough as nails. He was the only lawyer in Mississippi who would represent a labor union or a black person. A, a, only white lawyer, I should say, who would represent a labor union or a white person. So when I was in college, I got connected up with him, I'm sorry, in, in law school, and he hired me at probably, I don't know, $3 an hour to do work, legal work in the Harvard Law Library on this case that he had going. It was local, uh, local 1699 uh, against the city of Jackson, and it was a class action in federal court on behalf of all the sanitation workers who were suing because none of them had ever gotten promoted to drive the truck, which I mean is very simple. Uh, no one ever got promoted. The white, it was always a white driver, and the guys who were throwing the cans on top of the truck were all black. And so, uh, uh, in, the, in the depositions, they even admitted. They, they, Dixon had asked them the question, "Isn't it true all the way back to the Civil War, the city of Jackson has discriminated on the basis of race?" And you would think that today the people say, oh, no, no, no. No, they proudly admitted it and said, absolutely, that's what we've done. Because in those days, uh, blacks were not really registered to vote 
too much, despite the Voting Rights Act, although more so they had. So we had a very strong case. And then I came from my clerkship with Justice Douglas to Jackson and joined up with Dixon Piles and uh, thought that was going to be my career. It unfortunately turned out not to be, but I did spend my time on that one big case and uh, brought it through to a summary judgment motion. Judge Dan Russell heard it. It was too strong to grant it, I mean to deny it. It was too strong to deny, but because he knew we would appeal, but he, on the other hand, he didn't want to grant it either. But eventually the uh, U.S. Department of Justice intervened on our side, and that led to a settlement, a very nice back pay award for all of the class members. So that was, uh, that was my big case back then. But the thing was, and that leads to why it is I got to California, we were not making any money. You know, the, the federal judges wouldn't give you any money for civil rights work in those days, and the union work was not enough to sustain us. So uh, I was borrowing $1,000 a month to live on. I had a wife, a two-year-old kid, and uh, no money coming in, and nothing to fall back on, really. I had no, no trust fund to fall back on. So I uh, went to my wife and said, I cannot sleep at night. I cannot stand this pressure. Uh, we got to go someplace where I can earn uh, some money. And you've been good enough to come. She's from California. I said, you've been good enough to come to Jackson. And uh, this time we'll go where you want to go. We can go back to Washington. I can get a job there. Or I'm pretty sure I could get a job in California. Where would you like to go? Well, in a nanosecond, she said California. So we did. That's how we got out here, 1973. And when you came out here, you continued to work as a trial lawyer, and I, I think you, you traveled quite a bit on some of your cases. Yeah, it, it, eventually I did. I, of course, I started out as a lowly associate at a firm called Morrison and & Forrester, and became a partner later, and took some time off to go work in the Justice Department uh, when, when uh, Jimmy Carter was president, and then came back to Morrison. And in the 80s, by the 80s, I was a pretty well, I was pretty high up in the partnership and was the first chair on my cases. And uh, I, I loved practice. I, and I did like to try cases. I, mm -hmm. I was a good trial lawyer and uh, tried cases uh, uh, in various courts around the country and had cases in various courts around the country. Um, so I, yeah, I thought I, I thought I did pretty good for a Mississippi kid coming all the way to California. And then at some point uh, in around 1994, I believe, uh, somehow you had the idea to uh, apply for a federal judgeship. How did that come about? I liked being a trial lawyer. And I did not think that I would want to be a judge though I respected the system greatly, I just felt that judges were somehow uh, messages had been sent from God to select those people and, and, and uh, that was not my role. My role was to be a, a trial lawyer. The thing was this, I, I really uh, love the system, I respect the system, I admire our judicial system and when uh, one day in court, and it was in 1994, I was in federal court in San Francisco, I won't name who the judge was, I was waiting for my case to come up, and that judge was making one mistake after another. I could tell, I knew what the answer was, mm -hmm. and he was wrong on every single, uh, every single item he ruled on, and it was because he, he didn't really care, he wasn't putting the effort into the civil side of the docket, I guess he liked the criminal cases better, I don't know what it was, but that was the day I said to myself, right then and there, I said, I could do a better job than that judge right now. With no training, I could do a better job than that judge. That was the first time I began to think maybe I ought to think about putting my hat in because uh, I do believe in the system and to make the system work, the judge has got to be willing to do the work and it's not easy. So I decided I was, I was willing to do that work and, and that people who were willing to do the work and had the ability to do the work should step forward. So that was, I think it was 95 that I actually 
applied. I was uh, on the list of finalists twice. I almost did not put my name in a third time, but the third time I did get the, uh, the appointment, so I was very lucky. And you were far from, from where you had grown up and um, had come to California with your wife who had grown up here, as you said, but in terms of the people who supported your nomination, how did that come about? Well, first I should say that it, what I'm, oh, I'll, I'll get to that, the Mississippi part of that story in a, a minute, but I had, I thought, a, a, a very strong application from the uh, environmentalists in California, the famous Ed Wayburn was a close friend, uh, and also from the Legal Aid Society and the pro bono work that I had done, and I thought I had a, a very strong uh, traditional and uh, being a Democrat, uh, Democratic uh, uh, resume, and uh, so I never even thought that I would somehow find that being from Mississippi was useful. But the first two times I applied and got on the list, the two that were selected were very well qualified, but they also had a political angle, and I had no political angle. And I could see that if you don't have a political angle, you probably aren't going to get the, the final position. So I, I said, hmm, I just, so one day I was watching the news at home. At the time, Trent Lott from Mississippi was the Senate Majority Leader. This was before he made that crazy comment about Strom Thurmond. This was when he was riding high as the Senate Majority Leader. And in those days, just like today, the Senate, the Senate Republicans were blocking a lot of the judicial nominees. However, uh, I, I said, I wonder if there is a way that I could take advantage of the fact that he is the Senate Majority Leader and I'm from Mississippi. And, I, and it didn't occur to me until a few days later, it just kind of came out of the blue. I said, well, maybe confirmability is, a, is an angle, that one word, confirmability. Because I did have this, in California, I had the report the support of Democrats and Republicans. On both sides, I, th I felt I was confirmable. But, so this is what uh, I did. I, to cut through all, uh, all of this, I had a friend who turned out in Mississippi who I went, played Little League Baseball with and was a, still a good friend. And, and Bob, uh, turned out he knew uh, S Senator uh, uh, Trent Lott's chief of staff. And he went to the chief of staff and said, well, why don't you support this guy also? He's a Democrat. By the way, I gave him the same resume at ACLU and all that. I gave them the same resume. And they kind of liked the idea that a Mississippi kid would be on the bench in California. So uh, they said, eventually said, fine, we'll do that. I also had another uh, uh, friend down there, Senator uh, uh, Judge Charles Clark, and he did the same thing with a different contact. Anyway, between the two, uh, somebody from Trent Lott's office went to Senator Box's office and said, if you select this guy also, he will be confirmable. Now, at that time, that was an important thing because once again, I was on the list of finalists, but I had no political plan. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there was a political plan and I was confirmable according to the Senate Majority Leader. So uh, that's the way it worked out. Senator Boxer was good enough. I think, you know, she liked my resume because Ed Wayburn was a close admirer of hers. I think she knew that I would be okay as a judge, but uh, I think the confirmability thing also was important to, anyway, that's, that's the long story of how that happened. And just to put that in context for, for today's situation, what do you think in terms of the way geography, where you were from, played a role in, in your nomination, and not your nomination, but your confirmation, um, and how that maybe is, is different today? Well, I'll, I'll tell you a, a further story uh, uh, in that regard. After, after I got nominated and went through the hearing, there was a completely unrelated uh, controversy between President Clinton and the head of the Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, who was Orrin Hatch 
from Utah, and he had a buddy in Utah he wanted to put on the bench. But the president didn't want to put him on the bench because he didn't think he was qualified. So Orrin had said, no more people get out of the committee. Well, so, so for several months we didn't have, my name was stuck in the committee. So then uh, they, were, they were working on a solution to that, but in parallel to that, uh, I had a, I had, when I had practiced there, I had practiced against the management, well, I was the labor side, mm -hmm. uh, I had practiced against a guy named Grady Jolly, who by this point was on the Fifth Circuit, but when I knew him, he was just a guy we had coffee with and more represented the other side, and who was a good guy. And, I, and so anyway, so a, a mutual friend got me connected to, to uh, uh, Grady Jolly, uh, who everyone knew was good friends with Thad Cochran, another Republican, and and he and he said I'm going to call Thad, so he calls Thad, and he calls uh, Grady calls me back a few it was within an hour, and he said I just talked to Thad, he's one of these guys that can call him up and just get right through on the phone. He says he says I'm going down to the Senate right now, and I'm going to see uh, uh, Orrin Hatch at this vote. We have a vote coming up. And uh, I will say, get this guy also out of the committee. He called me back uh, probably 30 minutes even after that and said they had the vote. He, he, did, he did exactly what he said. And I'm going to say it was within a week of that event that my name got sent out of the committee to the floor of the Senate. I don't know if it could work that way again today. I did not know any of those people. I did not know... Uh, any of the politicians, I did know Grady, and I did know, know my friends, but I did not know uh, Trent Lott, I did not know Thad Cochran personally, uh, but I'm forever grateful for the work, for what they did for me in, in, in my nomination. It's a great story that, that you tell today that we have. Um, in terms of uh, your first first early period on the bench and the transition from, from being a trial lawyer to the judicial role that you had been in federal court and observed judges over the years. What was that like? It's, uh, it does take a time. If, if you have, uh, like I had, 25 years of work as a trial lawyer, uh, you want to take over the examination of the witnesses, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and another thing is, I love trials. I still love trials. I, I, I think some judges are, don't like trials, but I like trials, so uh, I would uh, deny summary judgment, I think legitimately, but if there was a close call, I would deny summary judgment and we'd go to trial. I, I thought that was grand. And then one of my problems was, though, that I, I would, uh, as early my early years, I would take over the questioning. <laughs> you know, the old joke, you know, the, I, the lawyer says, I don't mind, Judge, that you, you uh, ask, the, uh, ask my witnesses all these questions, but would you please not lose the case for me? I, uh, I, I, I probably did that more than I should have. But in criminal cases, I was always careful not to do that, because I, I think, I believe strongly the government should put on the case and the government should be the one to prove it, not, not the judge. The only thing I'll do in a criminal case is make sure the witness answers the question. I will make them do that. But in civil cases, I would have some, I would ask my own line of questions. And I still will occasionally when I think justice requires it, but not nearly as much as I did in my first few years as a judge. It takes a while. I think it takes a while for someone who's done something else for 25 years to to grow into that role, and I have changed somewhat over the years. Along those lines, I understand that you have a, a, I'm not sure if it's a formal program, but that you do take time to instruct young lawyers who are appearing in federal court. Well, I have several things that I do. I, do, I very much believe in the system, as I said earlier, and, and if we're going to make the system work, one half of it depends on the lawyers, and we have to train the next generation of lawyers. That is so important because they need to be the ones there asking the tough cross-examination questions. And what I have seen happen over my 25 plus now 15 years, 40 years, is that whereas I, when I started, it was very common for a young lawyer to get out to court and argue, maybe even be the only one there, uh, even if you were with a big, uh, well-known firm. 
uh, and it was common to be, at least in the early years, a second chair in a trial. But what has now happened is that the second chair opportunities have evaporated in, as time has gone on for these younger lawyers. And, and, and it's even the opportunities to argue a simple motion have evaporated. So here's what I've done for 15 years. I expressly encourage the um, law firms to send out a young person to argue. I'll, I'll even let the senior partner interrupt if they feel like they got to uh, straighten something out, but they, the, the young people do a great job. And I, I'm saying, I'm going to say, I'm estimating now that since I've done this, probably 80, 85 young people have argued in my court that uh, would not have had that opportunity. And with one exception, they did a grand job. The one exception, I thought, the, the guy tried to be a little too slick, but he, he, he was still okay. It wasn't like he embarrassed himself. So I would say the, uh, the odds are very good for the young people if they get the chance. Uh, and that's the future of the federal court system, and if we want to have the public continue to have confidence in our system, we have to train that next generation. And I'm sad to say I don't think that large law firms are doing that anymore. Not as much as they should be. So I work on that. I work on that. And also, in terms of continuing the system, there's the uh, matter of jurors and, and how you interact with jurors and, and some of the uh, responses I think jurors have given to you following trials. Well, I, I love jury trials. I also love jurors. And one way that a lawyer can get crosswise with me is not to respect the sacrifice that the good citizens make to come in and decide their case. Most lawyers do appreciate that, but, but occasionally you'll get someone who's callous about that. But I go out of my way to make the, it is a sacrifice, so I go out of my way to uh, uh, reduce the burden on the jurors and to uh, be attentive to their, to their needs. Now, uh, I think the jurors see when they come into our court, how hard the judges work to be fair. And that rubs off on them, and they, in turn, try hard to be fair and do their job in a responsible way, and I think they do. They pay attention, they follow the instructions, and, and I try to explain things to them, even as the trial is underway. I, I'll sometimes explain to them what a leading question is. You know, oh, the lawyers up there objecting, they're leading, they're leading, they're leading, and then when it's their turn, that's all they do is lead. And, and so I explain why that's okay, because it's direct versus cross. And so the, the, you know, the jurors like that. They like those little lessons I give them about how the courtroom works. Uh, but uh, the, one of the benefits of jury service to the system is we have all of these ambassadors that go away, and they say uh, how important that was in their life. I, I, I'm going to guess at the number, but probably two dozen at least have sent me letters or come to me after the trial was over, and they will say, this is the most meaningful thing I have ever done in my life. Now, that's a pretty important, big statement. But, uh, and they will often preface it by saying, I've tried to get out of doing this. I did not want to be on this jury, uh, but this was a... Uh, big eye-opener to me, and I am so glad that I had that opportunity. So I, I, uh, I really do. I think the jurors are great. I admire them for their sacrifice, and it's much more of a sacrifice than, than we the judges make or the lawyers make. They are getting paid almost nothing. They have elderly parents and young children to care for. They drive a long way to be there every day, and yet they do it, and they do it for their country. They don't do it so they can see the lawyers strut around or the judge or whatever. They do it for their country and to be of service to the U.S. District Court. Thank you for telling that story. And of course, I could spend a lot longer uh, than we have today asking you questions, but is there something that I have not touched on that in the short time we have you would like to, you would like to address for today's interview? I just would say in closing that uh, 
many days I drive across the Bay Bridge on the way to work and it's early in the morning I, it's usually dark but I see the city and, and I say to myself I am so lucky and privileged to have the job that I have even after 15 years uh, the, the, the ability to be able to come in and work I think work hard but work to make the system work, the judicial system work, the most respected branch of our government by far. Uh, and I, I do feel privileged to have that opportunity even still after all these years. That's all I'd like to say. Thank you so much, Judge Elsa. You're most welcome.